<laughs> I am the greatest fisherman in all the... What do you think you're doing? I was just trying to catch my lunch when suddenly this great beast attacked me from out of nowhere! This is an aquarium! And you were stealing his lunch! Greetings once again, my friends, and welcome back to another Geek News Anime Nights where we take on the uh, arduous task of taking on the Yu-Gi-Oh! Battle City duels. I'm your host, Adam Mickelson, a.k.a. Drac. I hope everybody's having an awesome day or night when you're listening to this. Uh, and let me go ahead and introduce my panel of fellow geeks, but uh, I have to do so in a unique way. Uh, so at that point, Alex, I am going to introduce you as the legendary Shadow Fisherman. Mm, I like that. I like the oh. sound of that. I, I always love the sound effect of the le legendary fish and it's so dumb. And then also joining joining us is Brinton, but I'm sorry, uh I hate I hate to tell you this, Brinton, but um your your uh your dad called. Well, we're we're not sure if it's your dad or not. Um but he called and uh decided randomly to just send you a card. I don't know why he wouldn't send you a letter saying that he's okay. I don't know why he wouldn't tell you that, uh, you know, maybe send him some help, some uh, relief his way. No, he just decided to send you a Dual Monsters card. Sorry, man. I was hoping it was a credit card, so boo. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure all of us would have hoped it was a credit card. So today we're going to be talking Joey versus Meiko Tsunami. Uh, so at that point, let uh, just to go over the uh, the quick lowdown of these characters. So first of all, what are the stakes? This is a Joey duel, so there's there's no lives at stake. There's no there's no shadow games. <clears throat> um, they are both wagering two locator cards. So basically, whomever wins is going to the Battle City Finals. Uh, and with that, we have Joey Wheeler, who is basically bringing his usual deck of. Vegas odds and warriors and maybe some spellcasters in there, but I think it's by majority warriors against Mako Tsunami, who is primarily a fish deck. And I don't, I don't mean that like he's got a fishy smell or anything like that. Um, it, that's literally the characterization. He has nothing but fish in his deck. And so at that point, it's going to be a deck of the sea uh, because we have to make as many of the sea jokes as we possibly can because Mako does it for us in all of these episodes. Um, and, and so really quick, just as a, was this duel good? Was this duel bad in your eyes? Brinton, was it good, bad, indifferent? Meh. Meh, really? <laughs> meh. Yeah, meh. Okay. Uh, and, and, uh, go ahead. Oh, like, well, like the phrase that came, like after I watched the two episodes, the phrase that came into my mind was, was it needed? Was it wanted? <laughs> uh, I will go ahead and answer that. Compared to the other two, oh no, they're cheating decks that we had to deal with previously. Yes, this was sorely needed. Uh, but that that's just me because like, I, I, I didn't realize this until we actually analyzed it. But it's like, oh yeah, Joey went from one cheater to another cheater. <clears throat> and that's pretty much what happened to him in Duelist Kingdom. He went from one cheater to another cheater to another cheater. Uh, because we can't, well, I mean, technically the double trouble, the double trouble duel was kind of cheating. The result was, yeah, no, he went from cheater to cheater to cheater. You, you get my point. Alex, where were you at with this duel? <laughs> also, Kind of mad like Brinton, but also agree with you. It's nice to have a straight duel instead of a cheater and for a change. And, and actually have two honorable combatants. Yes. Um, <laughs> as, as, combatants who actually kind of respected each other. Could, could you make the argument that this was Joey versus Joey in a way? Yeah, I you, guess you You could. had two Rocky Balboa characters is what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. That's, a good, That's a good way of putting it. Uh, I I will say from my end, um, this was actually refreshing, uh, and and very and a fun duel to be able to watch, and primarily because of all the schlock that happens during it. This is this is such a Yu Gi Oh duel, so I, I was laughing numerous times. 
during it. But uh, yeah, so we have the makeup of Mako Tsunami versus Joey Wheeler, both, quote, honorable players. Both have another reason to be able to win this tournament, uh, much like with Joey. Well, Joey's probably at this point, he's doing it for himself. He's he's doing it for the for the additional cred. Uh, because then he he doesn't have to tell everybody that he came in second at Duelist Kingdom. But Mako has the added goal that we actually knew from Duelist Kingdom. If you ever if you watch the Yugi episode, where Mako is searching for his father, who was lost in a violent storm, and so money's kind of dried up, and Mako needs money so that he can continue to look for his father. Which I have no problem telling you guys. I I know where the plot was going to go with this, but I kind of wanted Mako to win because like Joey, Joey already helped serenity. Mako hasn't helped his dad yet. And what makes this even sadder is I think this is the last time we see Mako. Uh, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, if he doesn't show up in any other, in any other duels. So, uh, yeah. So that's kind of sad. Like he had, he has an admirable cause. He wants to go find his father who was lost at sea. <clears throat> but, uh, in this case, we don't have too many uh, weird things happening, weird stakes, no lives on the line. We just have two Rocky Balboa-esque characters going at it against each other. And uh, what a pro- what better appropriate place to do that than at SeaWorld? I know oh, yeah. the ser- I know the, the episode called it Ocean World, but God damn it, it's SeaWorld. That's what it is, it re- right? Yeah, yeah. it's... <laughs> Yes. <clears throat> yeah. You know, and, and you have Shamu in the background. It's it's actually one of those things where, like, if they ever actually did like a weird Yu-Gi-Oh fighting game, I would almost want this to be one of the arenas that you fight in, because having like Shamu uh, go up and down uh, or emerging from the water that that actually would be pretty freaking cool. So at that point, um, yeah, uh, there, there's not much to go over here. It actually is pretty much a straightforward duel. Nobody has upper hands on each other. In fact, it actually is pretty freaking even. Um, so the last time we had a pretty pretty even duel was all the way back with Yugi versus Bandit Keith. And this one, I believe if I got the life point math correctly, it was 150 versus 300 before the end of the duel. So it came down to the frickin' wire, which, compared to some of the other duels that we've had to deal with, mm, kind of refreshing. I have no problem saying. Yeah. A- yeah apparently, it was point. just me that that had had these issues. So, what did we, what did we like about this duel? What were the positives of it? Uh, Alex, why don't you go first? I think I kind of said it already because you also said it. It's just. It was kind of nice to just have a straight duel that did involve complete cheating or rule bending or breaking the rules. <clears throat> I also like the fact that they had a captive audience and, and the captive audience is like, oh, yeah, that that whale that's jumping up and down. Oh, that's so boring. But a duel. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> I think people's priorities are, are a little everything revolves around card games. What was that? It's Yu-Gi-Oh, so everything revolves around card games. Appar- apparently so, like. Uh, Shamu is just mundane when it comes to dueling, uh, which is so weird to say, because like, you know, see, like going to SeaWorld would be a spectacle in real life. Uh, OK, so so you're you're kind of there. Um, Brinton, what, what what would you say that's positive about this duel? Uh, positive. I mean, I know I said meh. It like I. <laughs> I'm not answering. I was about to not answer the question like I usually do. Uh, <laughs> I would agree with what you guys said. Um, because the last couple of Joey duels, just to hammer the nail into this coffin, were very much just cheating and Joey having to deal with cheaters. So for him to be able to have someone who is not only just reputable, but also honest and is going to give him an honest, fair duel, which is what Joey wanted, is refreshing. Uh, it's it's what he needed, especially after getting the runaround. Yeah, and, and it's actually like the first straight up duel that Joey has had since all the way back in Duelist Kingdom with Rex Raptor. 
um, because that duel was was straight up like it was monster versus monster went back and forth numerous times and ultimately ended with a time wizard win. But that's the last time a, a duel like that happened, whereas that one was very brute force. This was a duel. This actually involved strategy. This involved uh, unique, unique strategies based around their decks that they had to be able to to utilize. Um, but since you're you're also saying that it's Matt Brinton, what is negative about this duel? Oh, you uh, you called me out. Um, <laughs> you're right. You're um, right. I did. Well, it. I, I was. I mean, I was just a little bit bored. Um, I like. I I just I felt bored okay. watching it. Uh, something that really <clears throat> just kind of like annoyed me. And I completely understand why it was written this way because Joey needed to be like knocked down a couple of pegs because he was kind of being a little bit cocky. Oh, I got this. I'm like, I'm an excellent duelist. Like, you know, Battle City, hear me roar. And it, and this like first part of the duel was just like, him getting completely creamed and having his ass handed to him, which made him realize, oh, uh, maybe I need to stop. I I need to stop being cocky. I need to stop thinking I got this without needing to put any real effort. Yes. And uh, I don't know. I guess it worked. I guess that type of. No, no, I'll agree. Joey, Joey did walk in with a lot of ego here. And it's, and maybe like it's I, deserved. I mean, I'm just over that type of story trope, and I totally get that this was late '90s, early 2000s when it wasn't cliche yet. Yeah. But I'm watching this in 2023, and it's cliche and it was boring. Um, but but you would also make the argument. You could also make the argument that Mako walked in with quite a bit of ego. Like he he'd already won four lo- locator cards, but he walked in with his unique kind of ego which is like he also has his honor code so at that point he was also doing the favor for the the one whale uh instructor girl so at that point like he was doing the honorable thing that ended up in a duel so right he kind of walked in with his own ego but he also walked in with his with his code of ethics Um, yes uh, alex what, what would you say was a negative of this duel Mostly because a lot of the duel, I think, is a bit of a repeat of when Yugi dueled Mako on Duelist Kingdom. Yeah, uh, that, that's actually, actually one of my complaints her. with it, but go on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we even have to hear Mako's story again. It's like, yeah, Mako, we know you lost your father at sea. But this and... time, we got more detail. Okay, a little kind bit of. more detail. Kind of. I feel like it was mostly the same, maybe a little truncated even. Yeah, but... th- this is where the nostalgic critic kicks in and goes, kind of, sort of. Kind of, sort of, yeah. Yeah. And <clears throat> it's like Joey kind of keeps repeating his same strategies uh, to the point I'm like, how do people not, like, just completely one-up him? Because he keeps doing the same strategy whenever he Although I, I will give points to him for originality with Dual Ballet. Dual Ballet. Where, where he did the weird... <laughs> dual Ballet. Magical, where, he, where he did the weird magical girl poses before his first turn. You guys don't remember that? Like he did like this weird ballet pirouette that annoyed the crap out of Mako. Oh yeah. Okay. I remember oh, that. Oh yes. So, okay. So we'll, we'll we'll give points for originality for that one because I certainly wouldn't have expected Joey to do that. You know, Mr. Macho. Um Mr. But, Macho. But here's the thing. I will agree with you. The the unfortunately, one of the things that carried over from the duel with Yugi was uh some of the duelist kingdom esque mechanics that came with Mako, AKA the fact that, uh, since they're on the water, all of his monsters can be quote submerged, um, which is not how that works. Uh, and, and so it, to me, it was just basically unnecessary, uh, not pandering. What's basically trying to fluff up, fluff out this duel and pad it that's the word i'm looking for in order to add an element that joey had to overcome i was actually talking about this with a co-worker today while at work because i was explaining to him the that 
particular field card. Yes. And for the most part, uh, that field card giving specific uh, monsters in his deck that attack point bonus is, is like not accurate. How that works. No, the attack. No, when you put down a field card, um, you want to build a deck around it so that mm. way you get the attack point bonus. Yes. And so that's accurate. The whole now I can submerge my monsters under the sea. I essentially was just like that. That I would totally be get... broke as fuck. Well, one, it's it's part of the illusion of the show, the yeah. fantasy of the show. Without that being written then what then like like you said adam there wouldn't mm -hmm. be an extra barrier for joey to overcome however i ended my sentence with if i was in like an actual card game at a card shop and i played that and i was like now my monsters are submerged and you can't see them they would look at me and be like shut the fuck up They're just like uh, just no. finish your move like yeah which, like, which is sad what? too because like we actually had good decent strategies being played by mako and they had to resort to that and i i feel like it honestly kind of dim it, it it uh diminished mako's dueling just to completely um, no completely if he could not have submerged his monsters if that was played out exactly as it should have been and you yes. removed the fantasy of it then that whole element of as I state, as I've stated earlier in the series, the Joey duels are duels for him to overcome challenges and grow right. as a duelist. That would have been completely shattered in this episode or episodes. Which there which would not have been that growth. Part of of Mako's strategy was, uh, yes, he had to, he had to get out the Umi card, the the water field, but then he had a bunch of cards that were uh, synergistic with it and actually made worthwhile strategy for him and so it actually hurt that much more when joey took all of that away because as soon as that card got destroyed then like he had a track card out that was dependent on umi and then he also had the legendary fisherman who got benefits from that card so at that point uh -huh. he actually had a really good synergy strategy going on um for for Joey to overcome, and instead we had to deal with the whole. Oh, you can't tell where the legendary fisherman is until Shamu surfaces, and then you're like, oh, well, that's the other shadow. Um, and, and thankfully they didn't do it with his last card because I mean I, I would just be like sitting there going, how do you hide this ginormous whale with freaking uh Howard's uh or freaking fortress on top of it? How do you hide that underwater? Uh, because that, that wouldn't have made a whole lot of sense, but I will at least give credit that they actually did showcase Mako as having a little bit more strategy and having a lot more fish based cards that he was able to work with. So at that point, I'll, I'll, I'll give them that. But before we, we get a little bit more into this duel, I, I do want to tackle some of the side content that was happening all around this duel. <clears throat> and let's just go ahead and yeah, start I'll, with uh, with double well, trouble duel uh, or uh, the double tag team duel uh, one point or the first round of it. Uh, basically, Kaiba annihilating Loomis and Umbra. Uh, and I, I'll actually say I kind of like that because it goes towards Kaiba as a character. The fact that immediately, like he wants to duel Yugi, but Yugi's like, "No, I have to go find my friends." Oh, and these people are in my way and playing rock, paper, scissor endlessly. Okay, well, I'll just annihilate the fuck out of these people and then you can get back to what you were doing. Um, so I, I I ultimately did like that. Um, I also love the fact that Kaiba used the same strategy as his dual bot did. <laughs> I totally forgot about that. Yeah, he, he used the exact same strategy minus one of the dragon cards was different. But, oh my gosh, that was that was actually pretty funny to me uh what did you guys think of uh yugi kaiba versus lumis and umbra round one or basically the squash match duel well i realized um starting the episode i wasn't gonna have i wasn't gonna be able to avoid watching it and getting to the point as i have been for the last couple of duels yes so i was like fine i'll freaking watch this because apparently there's a random duel in here um it 
meh. Like, yeah. Lumis, <laughs> Lumis and Umbra are, are basically buffoons in this one, which is kind of funny because the next duel that we're going to be doing is the second round where they, they seem much more cohesive and much more of a threat than they were in this duel. They they just seem like a bunch of idiots in this duel. I mean, ultimately, at the like, ultimately, everything that I'm going to be talking about is just going to get to the point of this duel could have been one episode, personally. Probably. Um. So it like just again, it, uh, I'm going to sound like a broken record in this in this episode. So sorry if I'm not super entertaining, folks. But essentially, it was just it's like. Essentially, it's I get why it needs to happen. There needs to be that suspense. Merrick is after Yugi's friends. He's desperate to find them. The rare hunters are now getting in the way. So there's blockades and barriers that are just continually presenting themselves. Mm -hmm. um, which, and is equally, like, but, which is equally making a very impatient Yugi, but also a very impatient Kaiba. No, for sure. I would say the only thing that uh, 2v2 Duel did is show Yugi that Kaiba's not messing around. He's coming for him. And this is like how much stronger and how much more strategic Kaiba has become, especially since enacting Battle City rules yeah. and obtaining an Egyptian god card. Well, not, so, not only that, but this was the first time Yugi had seen Obelisk. So at that point, yes. you know, like, uh, we, we had kind of a you show me mine, I'll show you yours kind of moment where Kaiba saw Slifer in action, but Yugi hadn't seen Obelisk in action. And so at that Correct. point, I, I think that kind of put them on an even playing field. And it also, in my opinion, also highlighted Obelisk as a force where a lot of people tend to frown on Obelisk because he's kind of perceived as the weakest of the god cards. Um, mm -hmm. if, you, if you use Obelisk right, he is not weak in any stretch of the imagination. And the way that kind of utilized him was exactly how you should utilize it. Yes, and sacrificing <coughs> all three of his blue eyes white dragons, which are his prized cards. Well, that, I also... think that spoke volumes to Yugi that's like, wait, he never does that. Oh, crap. Look at that thing. Well, that's exactly where I was going. So yeah. thank you for finishing my sentence. Yeah, exactly. Um, Alex, what, what did you think of the uh, uh, Loomis Umbra round one? I think Britain really summed it up very nicely. Just... Most of it was pretty uneventful, but once Obelisk came on to play, then it got really good. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just the only person here, but I, I just find it a little funny that Loomis and Umbra are, are basically buffoons in this duel where it's just like, oh, we'll play rock, paper, scissors to see who faces him first. Oh, wait, we do nothing but rock against each other. And that's funny to me because the next duel that we're going to have, they're going to seem much more coordinated much more deadly and and it's just like okay what changed in the course of like 20 minutes in this dual story that made them such a such a legitimate threat i don't know i guess we'll find out and then of course uh brinton i i know that you didn't like loomis and umbra but you have to admit that the meeting of the angsty club was also pretty good right sure and by that i mean when merrick is quote <laughs> recruiting Bakura. Um, I love that they had to meet in a back alley and oh jeez, that was that was the angst was so thick in the air with that moment. Well, well my favorite part is that Merrick is driving down a normal road and it's yes. like, okay, cool. Somehow and then, he ends uh, up in an alley. We're not sure how. And then Bakora is just like, I'm gonna step in front of somebody who's driving a motorcycle probably over 35 miles per hour down a small cramped alleyway and hope for the best. Well, I mean, and in, in, in favor, in Bakura's defense here, he is an evil spirit who has actually done far worse. Uh, I mean, he, he literally summoned a man-eater bug against a bunch of uh, security guards. So, I mean, he probably looked at that bike and went, bitch, please. But, but that's why we like Bakura. <laughs> It's because he just has that bitch please attitude. 
<laughs> like when he when Merrick introduces himself and Pakora just says, I don't care. Yeah, yeah, I love that. My name is Merrick. I don't care. Oh my god. <laughs> like he got he got straight to business. It's like yes. he's like like I don't know why I'm gonna compare it to prostitution for some reason, but it's like, you know, ten dollars for a blowy and he's like, just give me the millennium rod, like goddamn. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, it was appropriate because he did actually have something stiff in his pants at that point. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I mean, I do, I do like them. Go, go ahead. Sorry. No, just. Oh, my gosh. Well, can you say I'm wrong? You Well, you just, <laughs> just move on. <laughs> I feel awkward now. <laughs> I think I think I broke rent and Alex. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I actually, exe malfunction. I, I do like the fact that they had this, but I, I'm much agreeing with you guys. The angst was so strong in this, it was hard to take it seriously because you look at it and go, oh, Merrick just recruited another ally because we all know that the evil spirit of the ring is going to do anything to screw over Yugi. Plus, this actually adds into the whole Bandit Key thing where it basically reminds people that, yes, he was aware of that duel and yes, he did actually infect one of the pieces of the puzzle. So kind of alluding back into that, but also kind of establishing Bakura is not just some thug. He's not just some other rare hunter for Merrick to deal with. He actually uh, has an agenda of his own and he's not going to just sit there and follow like a uh, like a like a dog. Um, you have to give him what he wants in order to get what you want. And I actually do like the the uh, deal that they struck, which is like, OK, you get me two God cards. I'll give you my Millennium Rod. That's an even duel, uh, an even deal, right? Sure. Why not? <laughs> I mean, they're both just going to they're both going to attempt to stab each other in the backs at the end of the that's day. What's that's what's so good about this is that like, that's what's going to happen. <laughs> but see, here's the thing. Merrick's going to be predictable when he brings out the knife. Bakura, not so much. Um. In fact, I, I would actually love to have him bring back that I don't care moment. That that would be really great as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we, we do have we do have those separate moments happening in between this duel. Uh, but did, did, did you by chance take any notes for this, Brinton? No, I I okay. didn't. I mean, when the actual duel that we were talking about started, like, 15 minutes into a 20 minute episode i was yeah. like okay i'm just gonna skip back <clears throat> and not worry about it so uh I'll, I'll go ahead and go into my notes really quick and and we can have some fun with it uh obviously the first thing i did was loomis and umber are weird uh and this was like the point where they did the rock paper scissors that just went nowhere and even yugi was getting annoyed of it which is funny because like yugi's like this paragon of patience and guys i get that the stakes were were not in his favor but Yugi's this paragon of patience and he 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 even got annoyed with their shtick. Um, and then like I pointed out earlier, Kaiba pulled the same strat the dual bot did because he brought out Lord of Dragons with two flutes of summoning dragon, which got him four dragons on the field. So immediate or so immediately he has like full five monsters on the field, sacrifices for obelisk, and then has the other two to be able to activate obelisk's ability. Um, so it's not entirely the dual bot strat, but it started that way. Uh, and then also I, I, I love Kaiba's work. Like I get it. He's full of ego, but he basically said an Egyptian God that knows no equal. Yeah. Except for the other two God guards, Kaiba. Yes. It knows no equal. Except the other two. Who would be considered equal with them? <sighs> I love you, Kaiba, but you should have thought about that. Um, I also love the uh, the fact that this was the thing that happened with these two episodes. I was laughing my ass off for most of the time, so you'll have to bear with me. Uh, yeah, Mako was trying to catch his lunch at SeaWorld. OK, this guy loves the challenge of being at sea, right? Yeah. Can you think of anything more easy mode than going into Shamu's tank to try and catch your lunch? Oh, if you're wrestling with the big whale, then yes. Well, I mean, that, there's then there's challenge. But uh, initially, he didn't think he was going to be dealing with Shamu. So that that's what I'm saying is like, uh, he wanted super easy mode. He just wanted to get his lunch and move on, didn't he? 
um I so tools to fight so yeah i no, i i love that moment um and uh, and of course the other thing i laughed at is of course the lady's sick so mako has to do the show for her i'm actually surprised that they found enough time to advertise that mako was going to do the show instead of her because if you guys remember when they were running down the street the poster had mako on it so it's like wow you had enough time to change the advertisement okay Oh, yeah, that was impressive. <clears throat> that is impressive, isn't it? Um, wow. Convenient fevers. Anime, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and then also dueling is better. Uh, I, I love the fact that dueling was better than the performing whale. Like you have this big whale in the background and everyone's like, ah, screw the whale. Let's just watch the duel. Uh, so I, I just laughed at that. And then, uh, <laughs> OK, this is going to be a weird deal, but. I, I noticed a little bit of an animation error when I was watching this. You know how they had to do the whole shtick of like the, the projectors launching from their dual discs, right? Did you guys right. notice that when Mako's launched, he had no eye he had no irises? I uh they were that. no, they were actually there. His bangs yes, were just it, kind it, of Yes, but the way that it made it look because this is one of the things that makes me laugh about some Yu-Gi-Oh! characters is that their irises are so tiny that you can actually have like the bangs of your spiky hair cover them up. So it almost looks like he's possessed. And so that, that was actually my comment uh, comment was, Oh God, Mako's possessed. Grab an exorcist, Joey. Um, so at that point, then we had the dual ballet for the win. That was such a weird moment. And Joey will never do it again. Thanks. <sighs> I, I, I don't know what else to say. And I have a bunch of, of these like LOL comments here. Um, I also love the fact that Joey didn't take Parasite Parasite out of his out of his deck. He's been so busy, like sniffing his own farts. He did not take the one element that almost screwed him over in the previous duel out of his deck. Dang, yeah, yes. Joey's an idiot, so. That, yeah, no, no, he is. He is a dueling idiot. <clears throat> I think even Yugi's grandpa was like, what the fuck is your problem? Uh, oh, the, I'm sure. Now, we have our first foul of it, but I'm not sure who to give it to. <coughs> because technically, Parasite Parasite should have activated and gone into Mako's deck. So part of me is like, okay, maybe this should go for Joey because he didn't properly use it. But Mako didn't really call it either. So unless you guys have a problem, I'm going to go with Joey on this one because he should have activated that properly so there you go for f first foul to joey okay f first foul yeah. to joey all right uh and then i also love the fact that mako played a, fo a monster face down and he put it in a trap zone that had to have been that had to have been a four kids thing where they they set a monster card but instead it was a trap card because that's what it was it was a trap card so yay more disfluencies uh, I'd also like to think that all of Monty Python was screaming along with Mako at Joey when he was saying to get on with it. This was when yeah. Joey's ego was getting the better of him. And, and finally, Mako was like, just get on with it. Uh, then we also had, oh, good, an annual meeting of the angsty club with Bakura and Merrick. Oh, jeez. And, and by the way, if I haven't said it enough, Merrick's outfit, uh, he just doesn't look menacing now. He just looks like he's out for a, for a daily stroll. Oh, that's, that's what he wants to look like. <laughs> what I guess he does want to keep being conspicuous, yeah. <clears throat> no, I would actually say he's even more conspicuous this way, because now he just sticks out like a sore thumb. Well, he'd stick out even more if he wore those robes, so there you go. <laughs> I, guess you're, I guess you're right, but we're talking about Battle City where there's a bunch of random people in robes that are dueling out there. So it's just like, oh, that's hey, another one with robes. Well, I guess that's a good point, too. It, you know, it, it, I mean, and then, of course, of, of course, you, you had to bring it up. But uh, my name is Merrick. I don't care. And <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but like the the uh, gif of Ashton Kutcher from that 70s show going burn it immediately went off in my head when that happened. <laughs> uh, I like I had to stop it because I was laughing so hard. I'm just because I completely forgot Bakura did that. And it's so good. Uh, now we have our second foul. <clears throat> and this one is on Mako. So uh, Mako used the trap card torrential tribute 
when Joey sacrificed to summon Garuzis, except he didn't use it right because Torrential Tribute actually destroys all the monsters on the field, not just your opponent's side. So he should have technically lost his flying fish out of that, too. So there okay. you go. We have we have one of each. I actually used to have torrential tribute in my in my deck, and it, it was very helpful. It's basically a mirror force, but dark hole version. Uh, then we also cool. had the. Uh, I, I I also love the fact that when I can't remember what it actually instigated this, but Merrick's uh, Mako started sounding like a ranting grandpa. And by that, by that, I mean, like, oh, no, he was talking about the sea. <clears throat> and how unrelenting it is and everything like that. And I was just like sitting there in my head yelling, when I was your age, I used to walk 50 miles to school in the snow, uphill both ways, and then we got home and we liked it. And that that's all I could think of when Mako was doing that. You do that voice so well. It comes with practice. <laughs> and also telling a bunch of kids to get off my lawn. Do you really tell kids to get off your lawn? Yes. Oh, no, a lot, Adam. But but only as a joke. I have to, <laughs> I have told my neighbor's kids to get off my lawn, and then and then said I'm I'm kidding. Uh, they they more appreciated that I sounded like. It, apparently, according to them, I was a constipated old man. Like that. That's <laughs> that's what I'm going for. Well, um, at least you. Well, at least you let the kids in your neighborhood know you're joking. I literally tell the some of the kids that I don't like my stepdaughter playing with to go piss off. Dude, I, like their dad was out when I did it too. And even he was giggling. They're just like, Oh, uh, uh, do we actually have to get off? the lot? No. Yeah. No, I legit say it in front of parents. Yeah. People don't like me. It's fine. <laughs> um, the, the next thing anyway. that I had, the next thing that I had was, um, so now we get to go into Umi. Uh, which is the the ocean card that uh, Mako played. Yes, it is called Umi in in the game. And uh, yeah, Umi doesn't work like that, where it it hides monsters underneath. And also Fairy Box doesn't work like that, where now Alligator Sword has to come up for air. And also, by the way, observe Fairy Box, Joey's second magical hats. Kind of. Mm. So and then, of course, um, because we are at this duel, I have to tell this story because I've been told numerous times that people like this story. And if we ever did this duel, we had we had to tell it. So I actually don't know if Brinton knows the story, but <clears throat> right after this episode actually debuted by Kids WB, uh, me and my uh, my two best friends, uh, my brother from another mother who doesn't let me actually say his name. And then my buddy Jin, uh, we were all Yu-Gi-Oh fans at that point. And we were all actually collecting the card game. And actually, we, we were facing each other in duels. And this episode had just barely happened. And it just so happens the day before, uh, my buddy Jin had actually scored the Legendary Fisherman, which at that time was an ultra rare card. It was not easy to get. And he was super stoked to be able to have it, especially since Mako used it in this duel. And so at that point, he he built up his deck once again and actually put the Umi back into his deck. And for some reason, while him and my brother from another mother were actually facing off in a duel, he put the Umi down. And I don't know what possessed him. But he had a glass of water right next to him that he was drinking from. And he immediately decided, oh, I'm going to imitate the hologram, the holographic system. And he immediately thrush. He basically, he basically throws the water onto the dueling, uh, onto the table in the middle of the duel. <laughs> oh my gosh. And then <laughs> as if like clockwork, <laughs> one, two, three, four, five. He then went, Oh shit. And immediately realized what he had done. And he had soaked his cards. Uh, thankfully he didn't soak my other buddy's cards because he saw it coming and he's like, Nope. And, and grabbed all of his cards up. And at that point it was just, it was just my buddy Jin's cards that were drowned that day. Uh, and to that, a after that point, um, we actually would joke with Jin that he never, he never ever got to play the Umi card ever again. 
because if he if he ever played the Umi card, then we had to get a glass of water and pour it on his head. Um, and and I think at one point we actually we did try to do that and he ran off. But yeah, no, this actually happened. No, no, Brinton, I'm not kidding. I, I love that I guy. He it. just barely had his his uh, first son. And uh, and we still love to remind him of when he played the Umi. Nope, that is completely valid. <laughs> yep, yep. No, nope. I get it. <laughs> I get why he did it, but it, it was the dumbest thing ever. And and by the way, his legendary fisherman was on the table, so he did soak it. So he he was the only person I ever knew that had a legendary fisherman that was kind of soggy. So at that point, kind of appropriate. Uh, so the next thing I had was I give up. You know what, Joey? I give up. Joey, you're going to get a foul, but I am not explaining Skull Dice again. <clears throat> so there you go. Foul number two on Joey because he doesn't know how Skull Dice freaking works. <laughs> oh, well, at this point, I at this point. <laughs> but that's OK, because now we have another foul. Uh, just because monsters are, quote, hiding underwater doesn't mean that Joey can direct attack your life points. Also, Mako, your monsters can't hide underwater! So, there you go. Uh, for those who are waiting until that rant, yeah, Mako, your monsters can't hide underwater. And also, Joey can't attack the moon to recede the tides, okay? We're, we're past Duelist Kingdom at this point. Let's, let's go back into Battle City. Um, and I, I, like I said earlier on the, the backstory did kind of make me want Mako to win just because, you know, he's out there for his dad. Although, am I the only one that laughed when he got the mysterious letter, uh, from somebody that in included the legendary fisherman card? No, I like, I, I can't think of a bigger hint that like, Hey dude, your dad's alive. This is, and all this he is... Got for it was this lousy trading card. And Ali this got is, this lousy trading card. This is how this were, you know, this were this is how I'm gonna this is my opinion on it. Okay. Okay. So he's like what? Roughly, I'm gonna say maybe 10. Father disappears. Yes. Have has to fend for himself for the next uh like five, ten years. Yeah, where's Mako's mom? Yeah, you know, completely we, orphaned. We have a reverse Pokemon situation. Where, where's, um, just, where's Mako's mom? So, I mean, just like completely on his own, fending for himself. And all he has to go off of is, I, my dad is gone. My dad is dead. Years later, gets a randomly letter. gets a letter. Just random letter. And it's like. Do, does it even say signs your dad? It, it's just like, oh, yeah, uh, you, you might want to go out into the ocean and look for him or something. It. And all he gets is a trading card. And all he gets and is a trading like, card. And it's like, and and you just sit there and you're like, did he want to ditch out of fatherhood that bad that yes. he abandoned his son to the sea? Oh, and then the <clears throat> only thing, and like you know, leaving him to be traumatized with the fact that oh he like he's gone. I'm the only like it's me myself and I now and then he lets them know years later randomly for no like explanation no reason right. and instead of just being oh hey by the way like this happened and I was just trying to make you more like make you into a man this is where I am it's a trading card yep I I think you summed it up with your intro I think a credit card would have been better <laughs> yeah um, hey, sorry I neglected you for the last 10 plus years. Here, spend my money. I, th I think we found a dad that's actually more of a deadbeat dad than Sasuke. I mean, the, the best part is, is like the only traits of anything we have with Mako's dad was the fact when he saw the giant waves, he was laughing at them. So that that's what I'd like to imagine that Mako's dad was doing for those 10 years. He just went out in a random rowboat and just started laughing at the ocean. God, yeah, he probably gosh. did. And, and now you're thinking about it, too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so so I'd like to say somewhere out there in the Caribbean, there's some random man in the middle of the ocean who is just laughing at the water and no one knows why. Even Jack Sparrow looks at that motherfucker and goes. That dude be crazy. Uh, so, yeah, at that point, we had uh, we had that happening. And, and the backstory is kind of sad, but it also is very weird. 
Um, yeah. And then we have our next foul. Because uh, in one of the turns... So here, here's basically what happened. <clears throat> Mako had summoned Fortress Whale, which is by far stronger than Legendary Fisherman. Um, and so he actually tried to attack Panther Warrior, and Panther Warrior grabbed the Legendary Fisherman for him to attack it instead with Magic Arm Shield. And they basically treated it like Mako hadn't attacked, when that still counts as an attack, and no, Mako, you... Fortress Whale doesn't get to attack twice. And no, they actually did that because he also did attack again and and had consequences from that as well. Oh, and by the way, I, I need to mention this. Your, your favorite monster dies in a duel and immediately you're just like 110% disheartened and you're like, oh no, now I can't win this duel. I lost the card that looks like my dad. You know you're in a pretty dire situation when Joey has to pep talk you in the middle of a duel. Yeah, that like that whole thing I was actually pretty sad, which goes back to what I was talking about. Like the dude's traumatized. Yes. And all he has is a trading card. Yes. <laughs> and he's actually crying when the legendary fisherman dies. Did you notice that? He had tears yeah, welling up in his eyes. Mm-hmm. It's like, dude, like that's... I, I mean, Joey said it best. It's just a card. It's just a card, dude. Get over it. Yeah. Get a grip. I like the pep talk. I like the pep talk Joey gives him that. He, no, he it, gives... it's great, but it's just like, yeah. Was it necessary? I mean, it was a little shaky to start. And of course, this is just like the counselor in me coming out where at the start, I was just like, ooh, dude. Dude, do, like the way he's reacting, like that's a trauma response. Like, be careful, especially when he was like, when he it told him, like, dude, shove off. And it's like, yeah, Joey, you need to back off yeah. or you need to find a different approach because the way you're going about this is pretty poor. And then somehow seems to bring it all back together, <laughs> which was still kind of shambly ish. Yes. Um, that I mean, I mean, good on like good on him uh but uh, but i mean girlfriend needs some therapy after this duel i and guess I don't so joey the the thing that blew my mind though is like when back in duelist kingdom yugi mentions like he's a he's a world-renowned duelist so like he he's he's got a good reputation for him and that just made me ask the question like did he ever play legendary fisherman before this and did he have the same reaction with those duelists I'm pretty sure that would have gotten around. That makes me wonder if, <coughs> uh, oh my gosh, I finally get to say this. I, I have been forgetting to say this for like the entirety of this entire series. All right. <laughs> I love how a rare card equates to it being like the strongest card in somebody's deck. I love how rarity and yes. strength are of equal value in the world of Yu-Gi-Oh. Mm -hmm. So it makes me wonder, and this is just something I that I just thought of right now based on what you just said, Adam, is I wonder as these individuals who were invited by Kaiba to participate in Battle City, I'm curious if it was mandatory for them to add that rare card into their decks because that was one of the cards they had to put up for grabs if they lost um <clears throat> that is if a they good lost question on whether or not they i i hadn't thought about that before but like could you have had like what what is what if your rarest card is a fusion mon um and and so following actual Yu-Gi-Oh rules you have a fusion deck which is entirely separate from your from your main deck so what happens in those cases where it's a side deck card but not necessarily a card that you would use in every duel. Um, that that is a good question. Whether or not you you had to use the card, because I mean, ultimately, all of the ones that we've seen have been used. Yes. Um, including Time Wizard, and I would actually argue, like to your argument, just because it's rare doesn't mean it's good. And another good example is Time Wizard, because Time Wizard That's could easily blow up in Joey's face. Yeah. That. That was actually something I was going to mention as well. 
Uh, it's just it's just interesting how strength and rarity are so comparable. Right. And I I think I feel that's disastrous because just because a card is rare doesn't, like you said, necessarily make it <clears throat> good. Yeah. Um. And, and this is something that a lot of that a lot of players have to learn in the actual card game too. Is like rarity doesn't really matter because a lot of decks that um like a lot of mainstream decks when the trading card game started had nothing but common cards in them because all you had to do was have those common cards that broke the game and you were fine. So it, it's just one of those things where rarity does not equate to strength, but it's Yu-Gi-Oh! So they have to, they have to basically treat rarer cards like the freaking legendary Pokemon and like they're hard to get. Therefore they must be powerful, right? Right. <clears throat> Not necessarily. I would I would actually argue if you don't use legendary fisherman right, um, which by that I mean is that you you pair it with Umi where it gets spell immunity, uh, you have a one uh, one sacrifice monster that isn't really worth it because you could easily get uh like here's a perfect example. In Mako's deck, he had Amphibian Beast which is a 2400 monster and it's a five star like the legendary fisherman. So Alex, which one would you rather have a monster with 1850 or a monster with 2400? I would say 2400. Yeah. You could have something, the equivalent of red eyes, black dragon out on the field for one less sacrifice. Th this is the same situation with like summon skull too, <coughs> where um, <clears throat> if you play your cards, right either you don't have to use a tribute to summon them or they don't take as much tribute and you can get like with summon skull, you can get something that is as strong as the dark magician for one less tribute summon. So it, it's definitely something that uh, you have to, you have to take with a grain of salt just because rarity does not mean absolute strength. And for all the people who are going to scream at me, yes, I, that's why I pointed out the synergy. Um, also, if you have legendary ocean, kind of works the same way because it automatically summons uh the legendary fisherman but you have to have that rare card too so it's uh it legendary fisherman's one of those ones that i mean when paired properly it's a good card is it worth it to get it out on the field not really i would actually say fortress whale is a lot more worth it to get on on the field but that's me um and like i said i i think it's an awesome duel overall because it's basically two rocky balboas going up against each other and it actually like is close and down to the wire. So it is worth actually watching. Uh, but I do have one complaint. Now you guys remember what the battle city rules are, right? Yes, I, th I think so. <laughs> so when you win, you give your rarest card to the winner. One rarest card. Mako gave three. What was the third one? The only reason I'm counting this is because I believe this card gets played later in the Battle City Finals. So he gives the Legendary Fisherman, as well as Fortress Whale, and the corresponding ritual card, Fortress Whale's Oath. So Mako gave three of his rarest cards in his deck. Not one. I'm, I'm sorry, but maybe this is why we don't see Mako the rest of the time. Because even I would have looked at that and went, bitch, please, just give him Fortress Whale. If if Legendary Fisherman means that much to you, bitch, give him Fortress Whale. Solves your problem, doesn't it? Even Joey could have pointed out, uh, I don't have to have all these cards. And no, no, Mako gave him three rare cards. Because Joey will use Fortress Whale later on, and that means he has to have Fortress Whale's Oath. Which, according to Yu-Gi-Oh! series logic, both the ritual monster as well as the ritual themselves are equally rare cards. The silence means I have broken people's brains. I guess so. Yes, yes. No, I, I've totally broken it. But yeah, he gave him three cards, not one rare card. So... Well, that's just because that's just because Mako's an idiot. <laughs> I can't think of any other way to put it. Maybe that's why we don't <laughs> see him the rest of the time. I just... <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just getting, like, this is just me getting to the point, like, he's just an idiot. <laughs> he, look, Brinton, he may be an idiot, but uh, I dare you to go look up Mako Tsunami Rule 34. 
because he um, may be an idiot, but damn, he's good looking. <laughs> yeah. Huge pass, but thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we we know you you have you have a bit of a type. <laughs> yeah, so, Adam discovered my type over the over the course of the week. <laughs> yes, and so I, I've actually been teasing him. I've done everything except for send him the Big Hero Six meme, which is just like you seem to have a type. <laughs> so uh, that's pretty much all I had for this. Um, now, out of five, what would you guys give Joey versus Mako, aka the Legendary Fisherman? That's actually what it was called. Out of five, what would you give it? Uh, let's start with Brenton. Meh. I give it a meh out of five. All right. <laughs> and a meh equiv- uh, is equivalent to... I'm going to say, like, I'll be kind and give it a two. All I was right. a little bored. All right. <laughs> All right. It, it got a D. So at that at that point, Mako, you should feel really proud. You you at least passed. Uh, Alex, what would you give it? Two and a half. All right. Uh, I guess I'm I'm gonna be the guy the odd guy out. I'm gonna give it a three. I I think it was okay. it was still a much better duel compared to some of the other Joey duels that we've had. Like if if you gave me a choice between watching Joey versus Esperoba or Joey versus Mako, I'd probably pick Joey versus Mako. I think Mako I I think that duel is a lot more entertaining than Esperoba, especially with the piercingly annoying voice that Esperoba has. So uh, that being said, uh, that's going to go ahead and do it for us for this episode. When we come back, we have the one and only tag duel of this tournament, which is going to be Yugi and Kaiba versus Loomis and Umbra. But wait, did you get didn't you guys talk about that before? No, we're actually going to have a serious duel with these four and we won't know what's going to happen. Oh, no. Uh, but in the mean, what was that? It was a dun, dun, dun. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. AKA the mask duel, <clears throat> basically, because a bunch of mask cards get played in it. But in the meantime, All though, right. thank you guys so much for continuing to support us. We really do appreciate it. If you're brand spanking new, make sure to hit subscribe on the YouTube channel as well as being able to give a like on this video so that we know that this is what you guys like to see. You can also go to podcast platforms like Amazon Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts, as well as Player.fm and Spotify to be able to support us there. And we highly encourage you guys to be able to support us there. And like I said, when we come back, it's going to be the Double Trouble Duel. So for myself, for Brenton, and for Alex, we will see you guys next time. But the real question is... Will Kaiba be able to squash match this one too? Yeah, 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 yeah.